What's your problem? The 80s was a decade that changed the world of horror cinema with its hits that left people sleepless at night. Yet amidst these nightmare-fueling classics, there existed movies which, despite their bone-chilling and unsettling scares and screams, tanked at the box office or failed to secure critical acclaim upon their initial release. However, these underappreciated gems have aged like fine wine into cult classics over time. Over the years, they've garnered a following among those who dare to venture beyond the mainstream horror flicks. So in this video, we will explore 18 such horror movies that deserve a second look, and of course, your love and attention. Let's begin, shall we? But before we get started with the video, we have a small request for you. If you like our content, subscribe to us and like the video. It might just be a simple click for you, but it means a lot to us. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's get started. The Thing, 1982. Directed by John Carpenter, The Thing was based on a 1938 novella by John Campbell titled Who Goes There? Amidst a snowfield in Antarctica, a U.S. research team filled with scientists and workers find a helicopter from a nearby Norwegian research station, circling and buzzing over their base. The helicopter was chasing and trying to kill an escaped dog. After the chopper explodes while pursuing the dog, the dog is led into the U.S. station. The U.S. team then flies to the Norwegian base, only to find everybody dead or missing. They stumble upon some burnt mangled remains, which appear to be humanoid, and bring them back to their base. Unbeknownst to them, something sinister follows them along. The dog, who's kindled in the US camp, suddenly morphs and attacks the other dogs in the cage. When the dog is put down for wreaking havoc and an autopsy is done, things finally start to add up. The autopsy reveals it to be an organism that first assimilates and then imitates and takes the appearance of any other life forms, including humans. This revelation means that anybody can be infected and nobody can be trusted anymore. This sets off paranoia, which threatens to tear them apart as tension escalates, as anyone can be the thing. Despite a riveting story, Carpenter's movie did not do well upon its initial release. It was rebuffed and addressed as junk. Its failure could be attributed to various reasons. One of the many could be the film E.T. being released around the same time, which had a more optimistic approach to the whole alien theme, while the thing had a grimmer tone. Although it had the right amount of terror and suspense, it was deemed dull and slow. However, it found its audience much later, and was appreciated for its nerve-wracking terror in the middle of the dark, menacing, chilly night when a shapeshifter was on the loose. Possession, 1981. Directed by Andrzej Zulowski and released in 1981, Possession tells the story of a once happy couple, Mark, an international spy, and his wife Anna, whose marriage has hit rock bottom. Set during the Cold War in West Berlin, after Mark returns from a secret mission, Anna begins showcasing hysterical behavior and out of the blue asks for a divorce. Mark, who is still in love with his wife and unable to comprehend the reason behind such a claim, grows suspicious of infidelity. However, upon inquiring, Anna refutes it, but soon, a man named Heinrich enters the story and claims to be Anna's lover. With his wife's psychosis growing with each passing day, Mark is oblivious to the unknown territory of horror that he's treading on, and nothing could have prepared Mark to face Anna's bizarre obsession and sinister truth which lay ahead of him under the guise of an affair. Possession did not do well commercially and received a rather lukewarm response upon its release. Although it was petrifying and unpredictable to its core, it was rather too serious and unhinged. However, it received a cult following in later years. It was described as a mad masterpiece and praised for the mental imbalance it displayed on the screen. A little too extreme, but alluring. Life Force, 1985. Based on the 1976 novel titled The Space Vampires by Colin Wilson, Life Force was released in 1985. It was set during the year Halley's Comet was about to pass Earth. A space shuttle named Churchill was charged with the responsibility of observing the comet. However, when the team notices a strange life form attached to the comet, the commander of the shuttle, Tom Carlson, takes his crew to survey the situation. They discover three humanoids in a glass container. To further examine them, they decide to bring them back to Earth, but soon, Earth loses contact with the space shuttle. A rescue team is sent to find Churchill, which discovers the shuttle burnt, the crew all dead, and a single space pod missing. However, the glass container with the bodies are intact and are ultimately brought back. The crew finds that they have brought back their own misfortune in the form of a blood-hungry vampire when one of the bodies from the glass container awakens and begins draining people of their life force and turning them into lifeless zombies. When Life Force was initially released, it received negative critical reviews and was a complete failure at the box office. 
It was described as peculiar and was thought to have a silly and fragmented approach to the whole zombie vampire genre. However, it soon found its classic status when it was appreciated for its strange but adventurous approach, despite being charged with gory violence, nudity, zombies, mummies, and everything loony, it was vividly entertaining. They Live, 1988. Another overlooked masterpiece from John Carpenter's lot, They Live was released in 1988 and based on a story titled Eight O'Clock in the Morning by Ray Nelson. It tells the story of a homeless laborer, George Nada, who has come to LA in search of work. He soon discovers special sunglasses that allow him to see the world as it really is. He sees aliens in the form of humans who have taken over the world and have been controlling it from the shadows. These alien races have been influencing humans with subliminal messages that have robbed humans of making their own decisions. They've been manipulating humans for their own corrupt gains. It tells the tale of a common everyday man, Nada, who just accidentally stumbles his way into a world where the likes of him are tricked into submission and are exploited by the aliens to their full potential. The story is about an average Joe who's standing tall against the aliens as he is on a mission to awaken the world from its deep slumber of ignorance and give it a hard-hitting reality check. Although Carpenter's They Live was a minor success upon its initial release, it received negative reviews from critics. It was ridiculed for its half-baked social commentary and its long-drawn silly bedlam. However, the continuous shift in the tone and lightheartedness of the dialogue while representing a grave social issue is what made it engaging. Although it dealt with heavy topics of consumerism and the core of everything rotten being greed, it kept the premise amusing while the audience looked at the world through the protagonist's glasses. The Burning, 1981 Directed by Tony Malum, The Burning is a slasher film that tells a gruesome tale of bloody vengeance. The plot follows Cropsey, an alcoholic who was a caretaker at a summer camp called Blackfoot. A group of boys at the camp pulled a prank on the mean caretaker, but Cropsey had to pay a heavy price. When a prank went sideways, it left him burnt and disfigured for life. When he makes his way back into the world after a very long five years of treatment, he sets on a killing spree, seeking revenge on people responsible for his deformed state. Thirsty for revenge and completely unhinged with no one to stop him. Upon its release, The Burning faced backlash for its unoriginality and predictability on the premise. It had too many similarities with the movie Friday the 13th. It was slandered for its unoriginality and labeled as something audiences had seen too many times. However, decades later, it was praised for its gore and visual effects. Although unoriginal in the slasher genre, it had effective jump scares and was creepy on every level. Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, 1982 The third installment from the Halloween film series titled Halloween 3, Season of the Witch took a detour from the usual slasher genre that was explored in the previous installments. It opens with a man called Harry Grimbridge, frantically holding onto a Halloween mask and running for his life while he's being pursued by unknown men dressed in suits. Although he manages to survive and is admitted to the hospital, whenever a commercial for the silver shamrock mask is on the television, panic-stricken, he starts yelling and warning people that everybody is inevitably going to die. His attending doctor, Dr. Daniel Chalice, does not give much heed to the ominous advice and thinks it to be a deranged mind working. However, soon Harry is killed in the hospital and his eyes are gouged out while his killer immolates himself in his car. Unknown to what they're getting into, Harry's daughter Ellie and Dr. Daniel begin investigating Harry's eerie and strange death under suspicious circumstances. Despite offering a distinctive premise, it failed to wow the audience upon its release and received a negative reception from critics. It was called out for its laughable special effects, and the storyline had goofs and was irrational to begin with. But eventually, it was appreciated for its radical skepticism attached to a children's holiday. The town where Ellie and Dan were led in their pursuit of truth reeks of an unearthly aura, which adds to the menacing plot of the movie. Dan is trying to speak the recorder! Reanimator, 1985. Directed by Stuart Gordon, Reanimator is a comedy horror that was loosely based on a 1922 short story by H.P. Lovecraft titled Herbert West Reanimator. It tells the story of a dedicated and ambitious medical student, Herbert West, who is determined to find a path to immortality and adamant about bringing life back from the clutches of death. He begins his outworldly and bizarre experiments on his roommate's cat. He's later joined by his cautious roommate, Dan Kane, in his unorthodox endeavors. However, when the dean of his campus gets 
Tubbs' knowledge of Herbert's and his friend's practice, both are disbarred. This time, Tubbs all himself, Herbert takes it a bit further and begins experimenting on human cadavers to back his theory. However, Herbert's discovery soon turns into a nightmare, when every corpse from the morgue rises from the dead and begins walking around. These living dead eventually catch the attention of Dr. Hill, Herbert's arch nemesis, who intends to claim and take credit for Herbert's invention. Gordon's reanimator did not garner the expected amount of praise and success at the box office. However, it did exceptionally well when it was later released on home videos. It was praised for its successful mix of gore with comedy, and the fast pace it offered kept everyone on the edge of their seat. For a horror comedy, it had genuine and grisly jump scares, and steered clear from the predictable cliches of a horror movie. No doubt the film was a little over the top with its humor and dry, sarcastic jokes, but it was also extremely graphic in handling its gory scenes, not remotely compromising on its horrifying moments. Night of the Comet, 1984. Night of the Comet is a sci-fi horror comedy written and directed by Tom Eberhardt and released in 1984. When two sisters, Reggie and Sam, wake up from a good night's sleep, all they can see is a bloody red sky as if it was bleeding out, red dust everywhere, and no sign of life around them. Sensing something ominous has taken place, the two sisters set out. They soon come upon the realization that the whole human race on Earth has been wiped out of existence because of a comet that passed by Earth the previous night. The comet had turned the majority of the population into a pile of red dust, and people who experience partial exposure have turned into flesh-eating hungry zombies. As the sister duo embarks on their journey against the human hungry zombies, they're joined by other survivors. However, lurking in the shadows is a group of scientists experimenting to create a vaccine using blood of humans who remain uninfected by the comet. Critics labeled Night of the Comet as a poor attempt at a parody that borrowed heavily from other science fiction movies. With no originality of its own, the whole concept poorly and loosely stitched, it did not have any critical appeal. However, years later, it was praised for its witty and modest presentation of situations with a dash of humor, which made it an engaging watch, depicting the end of the world in such a nonchalant manner while the two sisters are ready to take on whatever comes their way, has definitely made Night of the Comet earn its place among the classics, and should definitely be on your watch list. Invaders from Mars, 1986. Directed by Toby Hooper and a remake of a 1953 film of the same name, Invaders from Mars is a 1986 science fiction horror. Encouraged by his father to stargaze, a 12-year-old boy, David's life, takes a drastic turn when he witnesses an alien spaceship landing near his house. When his father, George, returns after investigating the spaceship, he bears a marking on the nape of his neck and is a changed man behaving peculiarly. One after another, the people David knows as his own, his mother and his friends at school school, start behaving more strangely than their usual selves. When David sees no marking on Nurse Lydia's neck, he confides in her. Although initially unwilling to believe the child's story, Nurse Linda eventually sides with David. Soon they learn that it is an alien invasion trying to gain control of Earth. The aliens have been brainwashing and taking over the minds of the inhabitants of Earth, which also includes David's parents, to do their dirty work. Thus, David, with the help of the school nurse, tries everything in his might to save his town from a cataclysmic doom and set free the people he loves the most from the aliens' manipulative control. When Hooper's Invaders from Mars was first released, it was unfavorably compared to the original and was considered to be made in poor taste to the classic it was. It was deemed boring and unexciting, with everything already overdone in the horror genre. The world on the brink of an alien invasion has already been presented to the audience numerous times, and hence failed at attracting them. However, in the years to come, it developed its own audience who appreciated it for its camera directions, which forewarned of the menace that was in the deep shadow. Day of the Dead, 1985. In Day of the Dead, the world has been overtaken by zombies, and they're everywhere. Naturally, human civilization is on the brink of extinction. The survivor group includes soldiers and scientists who are forced to live in an underground bunker, while zombies are crawling all over. The scientists work day and night to save the human race from the zombie pandemic. Soon, friction arises in the bunker, when both soldiers and scientists squabble over their individual approach to curbing the zombie population. When the scientists wish to handle the situation in a more nuanced and scientific way, the soldiers just want to go on a wild rampage and kill the zombies in cold blood. However, the undead soon comes knocking on their door after they breach the bunker, and the humans have nowhere to hide. It received a poor reception upon its release, and was deemed the least interesting installment of Romero's zombie trilogy. They say it was simply a recycling of the previous installments, but this time with a bigger budget. And then there was the frivolous acting that lacked depth. However, Day of the Dead was later rediscovered by ardent cinema watchers, and has acquired a few fans since then. It was appreciated 
appreciated for its unsettling background, the spilling of guts and limbs flying in the air. Also, you gotta admit that it had some amazing special effects, which made the movie a treat to watch. But what makes it truly praiseworthy is that there are no heroes. You see, every character has their own flaws and hubris, which makes the premise very human. But more than being a horror film, Romero's third installment to the franchise sheds light on the unquenching greed of humans and the lengths they would go to to serve their ulterior motives. Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer, 1986. Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer is an independent psychological horror crime drama directed by John McNaughton and was loosely based on the life and crimes committed by serial killer Henry Lee Lucas. A fictional version of the crimes, it follows Henry, a psychopathic vagabond who kills people just for the heck of it. Although initially hesitant to join his killing spree, Otis, his friend, soon becomes a part of this mad murder bash and begins to enjoy it a little too much when he gets the taste of it. The audience soon learns that Henry Henry murdered his mother in cold blood because she was cruel to him as a child. He shows no remorse or compassion for his victims, whom he randomly selects according to his mood of the day. Amidst all this, Henry begins to form an emotional bond with Otis's sister Becky. Henry trains Otis in the ways of killing people and how to get away with the murders. But when the student tries to defy the teacher, things spiral out of control, and it's bloody for everyone in the end. The movie was A-rated, which eventually affected its box office collection. It also suffered financially and wasn't perceived well due to its violent and gory content, and thus was an acquired taste. However, it gathered a fan following in later years, and soon became a cult classic. The gore and horror it presented created a chilling atmosphere that made people shudder with terror. The murders were horrific and difficult to watch, which made the premise look credible. McNaughton's film does not remotely sway the audience to feel any empathy for the serial killer. Additionally, it is brutally honest and outright disturbing. Watch out for the scene in which a character is hacked into parts in a bathtub like it's nobody's business. Near Dark, 1987 Directed by Catherine Bigelow, Near Dark follows a young man who's turned into a vampire against his will. When one night, Caleb Cotton, a young lad from a small town, meets May, an attractive young girl. He has no knowledge his life as a normal human will soon end. Just before sunrise, May bites Caleb and flees. His body soon begins experiencing bizarre changes. When Caleb starts to feel a stinging burn because of the rays of the sun, soon he finds a coven of vampires led by Jesse. Although initially reluctant to let Caleb join their group, Caleb soon manages manages to ease them up when he puts his own life at risk to save the other vampire during a police raid in daylight. However, Caleb is not enthusiastic about the idea of killing humans to feed himself, which isolates him from the group. Amidst all the chaos, Caleb and May start feeling for each other. But things turn drastic when Caleb's sister, Sarah, is kidnapped. Now, faced with the dire choice to choose between his family or his beloved May, Caleb finds himself at a crossroads, bound to lose one of them. However, Catherine Bigelow's Near Dark did not do well at the box office because another vampire movie titled The Lost Boys by Warner Brothers was released a few months prior. The Warner Brothers film had better marketing and was released on more screens, while Near Dark had very limited screenings, which could have been the reason for its tragic box office failure. But it earned its rightful place in later years to come. People loved its setting as well as the way it was shot, holding on to the creepiness of a vampire horror genre. It had awesome jump scares and a sense of dread that encapsulated the atmosphere. The Blob, 1988, a remake of the 1958 film of the same name. The Blob is a sci-fi horror movie directed by Chuck Russell and released in 1988. In the small town of Arborville, California, a goo-like, slimy, amoebic organism crash lands from a meteorite. Once the slime comes in contact with a human, the human starts melting off and merges with the Blob, and thus the Blob continues to grow in size. It begins its mad rampage when it starts devouring and dissolving everything in its path. However, soon Brian, a local unruly kid learns that the organism was created as a welfare weapon during the Cold War, which later mutated into this deadly, slimy substance. Although the military, led by Dr. Meadows, soon arrives to control the terrifying creature, Brian has his reservations about the real intent of the authority. With no one to look to for saving, Brian takes matters into his own hands while panic ensues across town. The Blob failed at the box office and had a disastrous opening. Although it was a remake of a cult classic, it failed to attract audiences. While the original was straightforward in its goal, 
gore and violence, the remake had a sense of humor, which may not have worked for it. However, later after its release, it was appreciated for a par remake and gathered a cult following. It was lauded for its honest interpretation of the original, with an added zing to it. Since the original was released way earlier than its remake, it lacked the effective touch of special effects to make it more plausible and entertaining. And this is where The Blob earned its brownie points. It got its well-deserved accolades for its gore and violence, which was neatly packed with its high adrenaline action sequences. There are grisly death throughout as the organism keeps gobbling up humans, even through a sink, and keeps the audience guessing who will be its next victim. The Keep, 1983. Adapted from a novel of the same name, The Keep is a supernatural horror directed by Michael Mann and released in 1983. It was set in the year 1941 in Romania during World War II, when Nazi soldiers unwittingly unleashed a demonic entity into the world from what was called The Keep inside a citadel. The malevolent force then goes on rampaging the village. Soon things begin to escalate when a traveler from Greece claims to defeat the evil force. But when a Jewish man, Kuza, decides to aid the malicious force and remove a talisman from the keep and free the unholy demon from its prison, things take a nasty and frightful turn for everyone. Man's The Keep was a total failure in both financial and critical aspects, and severely tanked at the box office. It was slammed for its gloomy and very questionable storytelling. The performances of the actors were criticized and were accused of being half-hearted. Although it gave a taste of something new in the horror genre and the backdrop of World War II, it failed as far as everything else was concerned. However, The Keep later achieved a fan following and was considered a masterpiece. Despite its failure to try something new, it was commended for its visual appeal. With its striking moments and a background score that can stick with the audience after the movie ends, The Keep is one of those films that's good in parts but maybe not so much as a whole. Scanners, 1981. A Canadian sci-fi horror movie, Scanners was directed by David Cronenberg. When Vale accidentally causes a woman to have a seizure by using his telepathic skills, he is captured by a private military company called Consec. There he meets Dr. Ruth, who discloses to Vale that he's one of 237 extraordinary scanners capable of telepathy, who can control electronic devices and can move objects using his mind control. Dr. Ruth offers his help to Vale, who injects him with a drug to restore his sanity. The doctor later asks asks Vale to infiltrate a band of renegade scanners, led by Revok, who is waging war against the Consec. In this game of power struggle, Revok unfolds some bitter truths to Vale, which makes Vale question himself and his allegiance. It was thought to be too superficial, and failed to draw the attention of the audience. It was considered abstract, and was unsuccessful in making the audience feel the gravitas and anguish the characters felt, and was too rational for its own good. However, scanners drew the attention of the audience much later after it was released. It was recognized for its astoundingly great special effects, and was even compared to another successful cult classic movie called Psycho. It was seen in a new light, and was through and through entertaining. It was appreciated for its gore and grimness, which left a lasting and unforgettable effect on the audience. The Monster Squad, 1987. The Monster Squad is a 1987 horror comedy directed by Fred Decker. Sean and his friends are devoted members of a club called Monster Club, where they discuss monsters. When they get their hands on a diary left by Sean's mother, they come to know about a special amulet and its power to send monsters into limbo. Somewhere in the United States, Dracula arrives in the city in search of the same magical amulet that will help him take control and rule the world. He then summons his rogue allies, Frankenstein, the Wolfman, the Gill Man, and the Mummy to join his hunt and retrieve the amulet. With Dracula and his monsters on the loose, who would go to any length to possess the amulet? Sean and his monster club are the only ones standing in the way of the forces of evil. Despite an intriguing plot that paints the tale of Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, and others with modern colors, the movie suffered financially and failed upon its release. Its failure could be attributed to various reasons. The film's marketing failed to advocate it as children-centered, and further comparisons with various horror fictions killed its credibility. However, years later, after its initial release, The Monster Squad received a positive reception from its audience. It was acclaimed for its fun, light, adventure vibe, which resonated with the kid all of us had inside. With no use of CGI, it delivered exceptional scenes, keeping up with the scare quotient.
Leviathan, 1989. A 1989 sci-fi horror, Leviathan was directed by George P. Cosmatos, thousands of feet deep under the sea. A crew of miners, led by the geologist Stephen Beck, was assigned to extract precious metals. One of the members accidentally discovers a Soviet shipwreck called Leviathan. Upon probing it, he comes across a safe from the ship whose contents include records detailing the death of the crew, a videotape from the captain, and some vodka. When the tape is reviewed, the captain of Leviathan describes bizarre medical problems that suddenly began showing among the crew. Also, it was discovered that the ship Leviathan was deliberately sunk for reasons unknown. However, Beck's own crew members began dropping dead and later mutate and grow big. Terror-stricken at everything going on around him, Beck soon learns that the ship Leviathan was experimenting on its own crew members with undiscovered substances for genetic mutations without the crew's knowledge. When the experiment failed and was beyond their control, they sank the ship to repair the damage. With no possible rescue coming their way due to a hurricane, Beck and his crew of miners must fight to survive against a failed genetic experiment that is out to get them one by one, and won't stop until it claims their lives. Leviathan received poor reception and failed to attract the audience upon release. It was disparaged for its cliches and lame storyline. It was labeled tolerable and lacking in originality, and was a passable concoction of many films. However, years later, it found its ardent following and was commended for its tight and crisp storyline. The actors were also applauded for their gripping performances, which added a touch of sophistication to the whole plot. The movie was appreciated for its fast pace, while it had its fair share of hair rising and blood curdling moments to say the least. Cutter's Way, 1981 Originally titled Cutter and Bone, the 1981 Cutter's Way, it opens on a rainy night in Santa Barbara when a 30-something, Richard Bone, witnesses a man throwing something in a dumpster. Without giving much thought to it, he proceeds to meet his high school friend, Alex Cutter. Cutter, a one-legged, one-armed, and one-eyed Vietnam War veteran, is embittered and sour because of his injuries and is driven by rage. He wants to hold someone responsible and exact his vengeance for the pitiable state he's in. The next morning, when the news flashes the body of a girl who was brutally murdered is discovered in a trash can, and soon, Bone becomes a suspect. However, when Bone sees an oil tycoon named J.J. Cord, he's somewhat certain that the oil baron is the same man Bone saw dumping the body in the trash can. This piques Cutter's interest, and he decides to follow this through. So Cutter, Bone, and the murdered girl's sister join hands to bring down the white whale, Cord, and expose him as the killer. Cutter has found something that makes him feel alive after so long, but is unaware of how it's going to be life-altering and the extent to which he will have to go. When Passer's Cutter's Way was first released with the title Cutter and Bone, it did not do well. It was a botched release as it fell victim to internal politics with no promotion done at all. It received a negative reception and was soon to be pulled out of theaters. However, it was later re-released with the title Cutter's Way. Although it received a few positive reviews, the damage was already done. Years later, it was discovered from its obscurity and hence gained a cult following. The film was praised for the complexity with which the characters were presented, slowly peeling off their layers. The cast was appreciated for their nuanced performances, each displaying their turmoils with utter sincerity. The thriller was acknowledged for its ambiguity, with the background score adding to the uneasiness of the premise of the movie. That was all in this one. Let me know which ones are your favorite. Oh, and I'd love to know if you have any suggestions. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone. Hey!